You can go ahead and stand to your feet with me right here. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 6. Go ahead and flip there. Scroll there. Glad to be here this morning. Shout yes. <laughs> Amen. It's a real honor to be here. Man, he mentioned about our transition, Lauren and I transitioning to Gadsden to step into a new ministry role there. And um, I don't, probably the last time I get to just preach right here as a staff member of this church, and it's a real privilege, a real privilege. And I am more fired up than ever to share this word with you from Isaiah 6. It's, it's what's been burning in my heart. Um, I wrote four messages in this journey over the past three or four days. I, some of you preachers know exactly what I'm talking about. This is just the one that kind of emerged that was kind of loudest in my heart. And so we're just going to go for it. You all right with that? All right. Isaiah chapter 6. It's one verse this morning. Can you all handle one verse? It's so rich. It's honestly, I was talking to Bart earlier. We were talking a little bit about what I'm, what I'm about to preach. It's so rich. We could probably take six weeks and break it down and still not quite get there. Uh, but we're going to preach this. I'm going I'm to give it all I've got this morning. <clears throat> and we're going we're gonna to dive into that verse right there. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 begins this way. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, shout throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe, shout robe, filled the temple. Today I want to talk to you about the train of his robe. Just bow your head right here for just a moment. I want to give you the opportunity just to ask the Lord to speak to you in your own way. Just say, Father, I need to hear what you have to say this morning. Now, Father, I ask you for your wisdom. Holy Spirit, help us today. And Jesus, get all the glory. Somebody shout amen. Amen. You can be seated right there. Isaiah chapter 6, verse one, I'm going to, Kim, just put that scripture up there. The benefit of having one verse is that, Kim, you can just leave it there the whole time because that's where we're sitting today, all right? Isaiah chapter 6, uh, verse 1 begins by saying, In the year that King Uzziah, shout Uzziah. You're going to be hearing that word a lot today. In the year that King Uzziah died. So to really understand what's about to happen here in Isaiah chapter 6, we've got to go back to 2 Chronicles chapter 26 to really understand who King Uzziah was. Because what Isaiah saw took place in the year that King Uzziah died. The first thing we need to know about King Uzziah is that he was appointed king at the age of, wait for it, 16 years old. He was appointed king of Judah. Now, I need, five, who's a 16-year-old young man in here? Any of you young guys? How old are you, Zayden? You're younger than that, aren't you? How old are you? 14, not good enough. I need 16. Is there a 16-year-old in here? Are you kidding me? All right, is anybody 15? Can we get, come on, Tanner Hill. Everybody say, hey, Tanner. All right, Tanner, appreciate you, man. I call this guy my partner because one time on a lake trip, we, like, ran the, ran, like, ran through everybody in shuffleboard. Like, nobody stood a shot, and so this guy's my partner. Tanner Hill, 15 years old, king of Judah. You know what I mean? Like, that just doesn't feel right, does it? <laughs> to see a guy this young step into the leadership position of a kingdom so large, so expansive at this age, all right? Stay here with me. You cool with that? All right. King Uzziah served as king of Judah for 52 years. Five decades, all right, he served as leader. Started at 16, 52 years later would have been at the age of 68. Now, you already know where I'm going. Is anybody in here brave enough to raise their hand and say, I'm 68 years old? Is there anybody? We're going to get close if not. Anybody 67? Charles, come on up here, man. Can you run up here? No, he's like already regretting it. I shouldn't have raised my hand. Uzziah served literally for five decades as king, and we're kind of in a nation where leadership is four years and done, potentially a second term, so eight at most. This was a 52-year reign. Are you with me? King Uzziah was reigning. So watch this. From here to here-ish, King Uzziah was king of Judah. Shout Judah. This, this is a long time. How many of you would raise your hand and agree with me? That's a very, <laughs> Charles, I'm not trying to knock you, man. I'm just, I'm trying to prove the point this morning that this is quite a substantial amount of time to serve as king of one place, all right? And in this time, the Bible maps out in 2 Chronicles chapter 26 that King Uzziah did what was right in the sight of the Lord. 
And then it goes on further in 26 and talks about how because he sought the Lord, it was actually the Lord that made Judah prosper. And so what's cool about this whole thing is that the 52-year reign from a teenage kid to a grown man, senior adult perhaps, you cool if I use that, there was 52 years of prosperity. There was 52 years of triumph, 52 years of success, 52 years of economic growth, expansion. We're going to get into it here in just a minute. But this 52-year reign was a good 52 years for the people of Judah. Give these two guys a hand. They can sit down real quick. Now, some of us in here may not be too familiar with the kingdom of Judah. We all know about the kingdom of Israel and how the Israelite people made their way through uh, the Exodus and they conquested their way all the way into the land of promise over the span of about four or five, six books of the Bible. But here we're not talking about the kingdom of Israel. We are talking about the kingdom of Judah. And I don't know if there's any history lovers in here today. Anybody love history? Okay, we've got some. Y'all are going to love this. You other guys, you're just going to have to bear with us. Kim, I have a map that I want to put up on the screen uh, that actually make, uh, breaks down the landscape of what happened. So in the year of Solomon, uh, Solomon actually passed, he died, and there was a lot of people that were upset with some of the taxes that Solomon and his administration had imposed upon the people. And it created a large protest to where people were fed up, and ultimately, ultimately it caused Israel to split into a northern region and a southern region. So we have what used to be Israel. It split from Jerusalem up, really was Israel, and then from the uh, Bethlehem right here south was the land of Judah. We have a northern tip and a southern tip. And King Uzziah is the king of Judah. Shout Judah. Right here is where King Uzziah reigned. And we talked about how he had 52 years of major success. And part of the reason for his success was his military strategy. Because up to Uzziah's point, the previous kings, can just leave that map up there, the previous kings made it, th made it their mission to pile as many people into an army as they could. And from the year of really all the way back from Heroboam all the way to Jehoshaphat, it grew, the army grew from 100,000 people to over a million people. So Jehoshaphat is king, and there's a million people army. Can you imagine that? An army with a million pe over a million people in it. And that was kind of their strategy, right? Strength in numbers. The more people, the better. The more people, the stronger that we are. When Uzziah came onto the scene, he switched his strategy. He brought his army down, according to Second Chronicles 26, to 307,500 people. So he cut it in a third. And his strategy was that in, instead of strength and numbers, he was going to divide this 307,500-man army into different divisions that were going to go different ways. And that strategy proved to be, to be massively successful because of the expansion that I'm about to walk you through. On top of that, Uzziah placed a massive emphasis on having not just a million weapons, but having 300,000 really solid weapons, really effective weapons. And it proved to be massively successful because when Uzziah took reign as a teenager, he began to embark to take over the land of Philistia, which is obviously the land of the Philistines. Where have we heard the Philistines before, right? David slew them in 1 Samuel 17, right? David and Goliath. Goliath was a shout Philistine, all right? And so we see really in 1 Samuel 17, are you all cool with history this morning, are you sure? We see in 1 Samuel 17 as David pretty much under the grace of the Lord, a teenage boy put an end to the Philistine reign because we all know Goliath fell on his face. He was dead to the world, and you saw a multi-hundred thousand Philistine army on their heels running as far as they could from the people of Israel. So we see the Philistine, end kinda, or Philistine reign kind of come to an end right there. For the next few years, it endured that way. People of Israel were rocking. We eventually see a split between Israel and Judah. And now we get to the point where the Philistine army begins to encroach again and begins to take, retake back the territory that they lost with David until Uzziah steps in. And he steps in to Judah, a bordering country, a bordering region with Philistia, and goes back and reasserts the dominance that should have been asserted from the very beginning. After Philistia, King Uzziah and Judah makes his way to Ammon. Everybody shout Ammon. You see it kind of over there in the yellow on the east side takes over the Ammonites. We see it up here with Aram and the Aramites. We see it with Moab and the Moabites and Edom and the Edomites. And as King Uzziah is inserting this brand new military strategy, his 
world is increasing. Expansion is happening. Judah is fired up because the amount of success that they are seeing in their military strategy. That wasn't the only thing he did because within Judah... In Jerusalem, he began to construct towers. He began to provide settlements on land. He even put together an agricultural system that massively affected the economy of Judah, and the people are just thriving. Can you imagine being in this country that's seeing such massive waves of of success? To take it even further, we're almost done with our history lesson today. To take it even further, I don't have it on the map, but Uzziah went south of Edom and actually found a seaport town called Eloth, E-L-O-T-H, it was a seaport town that had been broken up in the, uh, the predecessors uh, that came before him. But he went and reestablished that seaport, which opened the door to more trade so that Judah could trade with foreign nations. And what happens when you trade with foreign nations? Economy just takes off through the roof, right? And so that's what's happening. This is what Uzziah did over a five-decade career, five decades of massive success. And it's not just the success that made him a good leader. It's that he, like we said right here, did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Here's what's crazy about leadership is you take such great strategy that's God ordained. You take such great uh, ideas, innovation, and you combine that with actual purity and holiness. And God just puts his hand on what you're trying to accomplish. and, And you see expansion and success and triumph begin to happen. So truly by all accounts... King Uzziah shifted the landscape of the nation of Judah. Shout Judah one more time. You got a picture of this right here. Picture a president or a major leader stepping onto the scene and positively impacting every realm of society. All while doing what was right in the Lord's sight. That was King Uzziah. But in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 16, here's where things go sideways. I'm going to make sure I read it right. It's a scripture. Uh, If you're writing it down, 26, 16. When he was strong, shout strong. How many would agree he was in a strong place? How many would agree he was in a successful? How many of you believe that kings all over the world saw what what Uzziah was standing in and said, I'd love to be standing in that place? But it was when he was strong, his heart was lifted up. Things are about to go sideways right here because in his success, he began to think that he was something. In his strength, perhaps the strongest leader on the globe at this point, he began to think he had accomplished something. What he forgot was that it was way bigger than him. What he forgot is that strategy would not have been enough. What he forgot was that it was the Lord's hand placed upon his best efforts that caused them to succeed. His heart turned sideways to the point. You ready for this? This is how 2 Chronicles 26 comes to an end. His heart turned so sideways that to the point, he began to frolic into the holy of holies. Frolic, just kind of pranced in there. No fear of the Lord, right? No consciousness of his presence. And what happens when someone is not allowed to enter the holy of holies according to God's design, walks in? How many of you know that's bad news? But he was so arrogant in his heart that he thought, okay, you know, God's on my side. We're good. We're together. He's my friend. We're buddies. He he won't mind. You know, he prances in, no fear of the Lord, and starts burning incense unto God. Eighty of King Uzziah's most valiant men watched this happen and sprinted into the Holy of Holies to jerk him out because he was outside the fear of the Lord and had no business being in there. King Uzziah looks over his shoulder while he's burning incense to God, sees these 80 valiant men trying to rip him out, snobs his nose, and keeps burning incense unto the Lord. It was in that moment that he kept burning and did not heed to the suggestion, first of the Lord's command, but next to his 80 valiant men, that leprosy began to form on his forehead. When the 80 valiant men saw that leprosy began to form, they didn't just ask him to leave anymore. 80 valiant men went and grabbed this mighty king and drug him out of the holy of holies. But at that point, it was too late. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 21, that he was a leper until the day of his death. What a beautiful beginning and simultaneously what a tragic end to experience such mighty successes yet end in such tragedy and disgrace. 
So now the nation that had a, seen so much expansion, so much success, so much economic growth, so much territorial growth, finds themselves without a leader. Vulnerable, uncertain, scared to death of what is next. How many of you know when a powerful leader goes down, it makes that nation vulnerable to other nations? How many of you know Philistia probably had some beef with Judah? How many of you know that Edomites probably had some beef with Judah? And when that king went down, you better believe the door swung wide open and the people of Judah were scared to death about their uncertain future. This brings us to Isaiah chapter 6. Where we started, Kim, you can go there because in the year that Uzziah died, God put a prophet onto the scene. In the year that the people of Judah stood in such massive uncertainty. Have you ever stood in uncertainty before? Like, oh, I don't know what's next. I'm scared to death of what's to come. That's where Judah is right now. But God did not leave these people stranded because it was in the year Uzziah died that Isaiah got a vision and was called into the office of prophet. Here's what Isaiah saw, and here's what we've got to see today. Here's what the people of Judah had to see. In the year that King Uzziah died, the first thing Isaiah said is, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Kim, leave that up there right there. All of Judah is wondering, where is God? Seriously, God, 50 years of success, and this happens, and you're just leaving us out to dry? 50 years of economic expansion and just beautiful way. Kids are loving this. Grandkids are being born. It's all good news. Now what, God, right? Have you left us? Where are you? What is next? Our future is uncertain, and we're scared to death. When people of Judah were asking, where is God? Isaiah settled it once and for all. He said, I know where he is, and he is sitting on his throne. The first message we've got to hear right now is that in the midst of uncertainty upon our own life, we've got to be reminded that even if God seems silent, we know where, we know where he can be found. And if you ever feel like God's silent, who's been there before, right? Where are you, God, right? Remind yourself what Isaiah saw in chapter 6. I know where he is, and he is sitting on his throne. Let me remind all of us that the throne is a place of authority. The throne is a place of power. The throne is a place of glory. And as Isaiah looked into the throne room, he saw the Lord sitting in that place of authority and power. And I wonder how comforting it was to the people of Judah to realize that even though that their head position had been overthrown, there the Lord still sat. And I came to remind all of us that when there's change in nations and leadership and things seem to ebb and flow from here to success, to failure, success, to failure, thriving, struggling, as that ebbing and flowing continues to take place, I, rem I need to remind all of us that we need to set our eyes to one place to remind ourselves that when we don't know who sits on this throne, we do know who sits on that one. And that's enough for me. Shout amen. The second thing we see here in Isaiah chapter 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, but he wasn't just on any throne. He was on the throne that was high and what? Lifted up. This is not some mediocre throne that's sitting here struggling to compete for its power and its authority. This was a throne that God the Father sat on that was high and lifted up above any other throne. And I don't have the time today to sit here and map out what all thrones have tried to set themselves up against the knowledge of God across this earth in the past 3,000 years. But what I do have time to remind all of us to, to remember is that no matter how many kingdoms try and set themselves up against his, his will still remain superior. His will still be higher. His will still be lifted up. His will still be exalted. It's not even a competition. One psalmist wrote and said, the song, or God sits in the heaven and laughs, right? Because he is sitting there like, not in some arrogant way, just in holiness, like, I'm exalted. You with me? I'm, I'm holy, his throne is high and lifted up. And what's crazy about it all is now on this side of Calvary. So, so this is before the cross, obviously, in Isaiah. He's a prophet that is seeing what is to come some, I don't know, seven, eight hundred years from then. We get the privilege of standing on this side of the cross to fully understand how high that his seat really is. You with me? What a, what a, what a, what a, 
what a joy it is to actually be able to see unfolded what Isaiah could only prophesy about. And here we stand today fully resting assured in one thing, and that it's his throne is higher than any other and will never be overthrown by another. Shout amen. Somebody needs to rest assured in that. Maybe you've been walking through massive seasons of uncertainty. Maybe you've been walking through great seasons of struggle. Maybe everything was good like it was in Judah and everything flipped on its head with a bad choice. You Don't be arrogant enough to think you can do something to dethrone him. Don't you be arrogant enough to believe something as foolish and ignorant as that. He is Lord. It is settled once and for all, and he will always be Lord. Are you glad about that? We're moving quick. Worship team, come on. The last thing we saw in Isaiah chapter 6. In the, key, in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord. First off, that's good news, right? In your toughest season ever, sometimes it's just important that we catch a glimpse of him. Who can testify to that? And it just somehow gives you the strength to carry on. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. Here's the third thing you, that Isaiah saw. And the train of his robe filled what? It filled the temple. Isaiah's catching a glimpse of the throne room. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Listen, Dwayne, you can begin whenever you're ready. In this day, when a king would defeat another nation, when a king would arise victorious over another people group or another region, the victorious king would visit, eyes right here, would visit the defeated king, would snip off, snip off a piece of the defeated king's robe and sew it on his own. So when someone walked into the room and saw a king with a long robe, what it meant, was that that king had many victories. It evoked the sense of the fear of God because you see that and you say, oh, he's not a king to be messed with. He has been triumphant over and over and over again. It evokes a sense of honor because we see that the king is so massively victorious that all we, it's just like a sense of, I just need to pay honor to that. There's recognition for honor there. what Isaiah saw in his vision as he's being commissioned into the office of prophet. It wasn't a normal king's robe train that he got a vision of. It was the train of the Lord's robe. And it was so magnificent that it filled the temple. What is Isaiah saying to us? He is saying to us that the Lord is so massively victorious. Oh, it looked like Uzziah was victorious, not a chance. It looked like David was victorious, doesn't even come close. It looks like Solomon, it looks like Saul, no. The train of their robe would not even be a speck in the dirt in comparison to how massive that the train of our Lord's robe is. And when a nation was in turmoil and people were left in fear wondering what's next, when the uncertainty of this day was at an all-time high, there was something they could be certain of. And that it was that the Lord is massively victorious. Shout amen. Hmm. Kim, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul writes this letter on the backside of Calvary to the church in Corinth. Follow me right here. Don't leave me yet. We're almost done. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in what? Say it like you mean it. Death is swallowed up in verse 55. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? 56. The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. 57 is where we land. Thanks be to God. Who what? Watch this. Now, just because the train of his robe filled the temple and he was so victorious that it, it, really Isaiah couldn't even see the end of it. It didn't stop there. 57 says, thanks be to God who gives us the victory. 
Watch what has happened. He has taken his own train and he has filled us with it. He has taken every ounce of victory that he achieved through the sun and has placed it on our life. And I just, if there's nothing else I came by to say this morning, I came by to declare over you that you are a victorious people because of how victorious that he is. And I'm talking about when we were down bad in this battle, when we were down and out and there was no hope, when it was a landslide of a margin between us and our enemy. God just stepped onto our team and the landscape shifted. You didn't do anything. You were sitting in the dugout. We, I was sitting there with you. You didn't contribute to this victory. Once and for all, with one sacrifice, he eternally purchased the victory on his own. And now I stand here today not because I've accomplished anything, but because he has accomplished everything. And I stand secure in his victory. There is not an ounce of my own. I would have failed a thousand, a million, make it as big as you want to, times over and over and over. Had he not come onto my team, I would be down in the dirt with no way up. But he just walked in the dugout, and I saw him walk in, and it was like, oh, it's, they're done. <laughs> they're done. Oh. He is our victorious warrior. Here's where we've got to get to today before I finish. He's inviting us to sit before him. And he places his train at our feet, which, by the way, is so big that the whole earth would be like a little piece of, like a little marble underneath his, tra his, his train. You with me? That, it's a, his, his, the train of his robe is a blanket over this entire earth. And he lets us one by one begin to look through the sewings and the stitchings of the kings that he has defeated. And one by one, we make our way through and we find the first one, it's like addiction. It's sewed onto his robe because he's victorious over it. Betrayal and rejection, it's like you find that one. It's like, yeah, he's victorious over that too. Regret, shout regret. How many of you ever, ever carried regret for a season because you feel like you missed it? Well, I promise you this morning, he's victorious over that regret. We'll keep going down the list here. How about shame? It's stitched into his robe. Because it was once a king that tried to elevate itself above the knowledge of God. And then Christ in one breath, at, when he rose again in the tomb, defeated it once and for all. And God through the Son has defeated death. I mean, defeated shame and is victorious over it. How about anxiety? How about depression? If you're sitting here with anxiety and depression, just sit down at his feet long enough. Ask him to spread his train out before you and filter through it until you find the one that you need to see. You'll find anxiety and you'll realize that this battle you've been fighting, he's already won it. This depression you've been fighting all along, he's already won it. Done. Sealed. Finished. He is victorious. And I came by to remind us all that not even death could hold him. Not even death could hold him. When Jesus breathed his last breath on the cross, death itself was met with the supreme personification of life, purity, and power. And in this massive clash between death and life itself, they, they clashed, they collided right there. Death was massively defeated. And life reigns forevermore. You know, I think back on my own journey. Different trials, different griefs, different struggles, losing my dad, dealing with struggles through that. He passed away seven years ago, for those of you who are unfamiliar with my story. And I'm just reminded that each person in this room has stories like that. But if there's one thing that can keep us going, it's the understanding, it's the revelation that Christ is victorious over it all. And that I can lay my head on the pillow at night and not even have to glimpse an ounce of fear. Don't even have to open my eyes to fret and anxiety. I can rest assured that his victory is, is, is sealed. But not just that, that he has actually given it to us to walk in and enjoy all the days of our lives. Would you stand to your feet? It's the only reason man can praise God in the biggest agony of his life. It's the only reason. Why don't you go back to that season in your mind right now? that there was no way through. You were just ready for it to end. Not a chance, man. And then God, God opened your eyes to the revelation that the victory he has purchased has been given to you. What happens in that moment is really just an eruption of praise because there's no self accolade in that. I can't pat myself on the back for that one. 
Oh, but he gave me a beautiful gift. And as I hold that gift called salvation, as I hold that gift called triumph, all I can do is just rest in all. Are you serious, Lord? <sighs> in all the days of my life, as we hold that gift, wow. Every day I wake up and I see it sitting in my hand again. I'm like, man, oh, your mercy is so great. Your mercy is so great. Oh, wake up the next morning, it's like, oh, <laughs> It's still there because he could pull it if he wanted to. But it's his mercy that keeps it planted right in the middle of your, of your grasp. And when I walk into eternity, after breathing my last breath here, that gift that he's given me, I'm going to crown him with it. It's going to be one of the most beautiful moments. And in fact, it's that day that sometimes just keeps us going. Oh. You breathe your last here, you step before God the Father at his throne, the throne that Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6. And you're like, wow, it really is high and lifted up. <laughs> and you see the train of his robe, and it's like, whoa. It's just circumferencing you. And then you look down, and you see salvation stand, sitting in your hands, and you can't run to him quick enough to just clothe him with it. Say, Father, it was you and it was only you. You are the reason that I stand here this day. And because of your gift to me, I will worship you all the days of all of eternity. And that's it right there. That's the great ending right there. Us and him together forever.